My next guest is Eric Francis. Eric is an international author, presenter, and speaker with over 25 years of experience in education. He is the author of Now That's a Good Question, How to Promote Cognitive Rigor Through Classroom Questioning, published by ASCD. His book, Deconstructing Death of Knowledge, a Method and Model for Deeper Learning and Teaching, will be published by Solution Tree International in October 2021. Eric is the owner of Maverick Education, providing academic professional development guidance and support on how to develop and deliver teaching and learning experiences that are academically rigorous, socially and emotionally supportive and student responsive. He is also ranked consistently as one of the world's top 30 educational professionals by the international research organization, Global Gurus. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I think I, I butchered the name of your book. It's Deeper Teaching and Learning, correct? That, that's okay. As long as I got the regular title, which is Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge, the okay, that's totally fine. No worries yeah. about that. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. And, um, you know, we had a pre-chat. We talked a lot about just some of your experiences leading up to where you are now. So I'll start out like I start out with everybody. Tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. I would say my first uh, experience being, being um, a site administrator and assistant principal, um, it was an interesting experience. And I take ownership kind of about uh, the way it was because it didn't turn out really great for me mm -hmm. uh, at the time professionally. Later it did. Mm -hmm. um, I became an assistant principal at a middle school in a district that actually I started my career in and went back to the middle school. And the unfortunate thing is, is that the year before they inherited, um, I, I inherited a number of um, uh, personnel, operational, managerial issues that mm -hmm. were going on. Um, I don't want to get into like the knee deep of the hoopla with it, but it's probably like the worst type you can have. Mm -hmm. And I kind of inherited that. Well, I, I guess I say, you know, there was some um, uh, sexual inappropriate behavior amongst mm -hmm. the kids. Um, the assistant principal was before me, he left, and I kind of inherited that and came in. And it was also tough because you know, he was really um, a, a very, very well-respected, beloved guy. Now here I come, I'm filling in the shoes. And to be honest, I don't even know if I was ready to make that leap yet. Um, I mm -hmm. dated students the year before at another school. And really, I wanted to make the leap to be an assistant principal for two reasons. One, you know, moving up on the ladder. And two, the unfortunate thing is, is that um, when I was dean of students, I was a teacher on assignment. And I was doing administrative duties, but I didn't um, um, get the salary. Mm -hmm. It was a tough year. Um, it was tough, not because of the student population. The student population, you know, had, um, it was actually high social economic. Mm -hmm. uh, and the parents were very involved and the parents were very vocal. And it wasn't that, um, a lot of it, I think, you know, was a lot of repercussions and, and consequences about what happened the year before with those teachers and the scandal that they went through. It was pretty scandalous. It was in the papers out and everything out mm -hmm. there. So, um, so I didn't last more than a year. And um, it was more so an agreement to say that this just isn't working. But, you know, to turn a, a tragedy into a success, because I was really devastated. I mean, I had my whole career plotted out. Classroom mm -hmm, teacher, mm -hmm. site administrator, principal, director of curriculum instruction or professional development somewhere, assistant superintendent, superintendent, go teach college, all mapped out. I got kind of knocked off the track. So instead, um, of going for another assistant principal position, I went to State Department of Education here in Arizona, where I it just completely changed my perspective of education. I learned more about um, policy. I learned more about um, budgets and, and finances and, mm -hmm. and federal and state funding. Um, and it really kind of led me to the career I am today. So while it was very, very, very tough at the time, and, and, and it was really challenging, and my ownership was of it was I, I wasn't ready. And I didn't really have any mentors. I had mm -hmm. coaches, but the coaches more so were like, well, what should I do about this? Well, I don't know. What do you think you should do about it? Really mm -hmm. mm -hmm. track. And it wasn't really effective in terms of mentoring with that. But I'd say calling out of the trenches is that it, it put me on a path that I would have never foresaw for myself. You know, this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doing, you know, I always wanted to be an instructional leader, which is why I went to school administration, but I felt like I was anything but an instructional leader. I was a cop without a badge, a psychologist, mm -hmm. and counselor, mm -hmm. you know? um, and, and basically it put me on this path of professional development and doing instructional leadership. 
And uh, now I've been a, you know, what the biggest they call an education consultant. I like to call myself a professional education specialist. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been on this career path and for the last nine years, um, lucky it hasn't slowed down. The pandemic has really created a trench, but uh, crawling out and everyone seems to be crawling out of it too. So that's, mm -hmm. kind of, so I guess the lesson learned of it is really think about the position you want and mm -hmm. the position that fits you don't just go after it because it's money or it's it's mm -hmm. something that's higher up on on the, on not only the professional scale but the salary scale and it's funny because i've been asked to be an assistant principal and a principal and go back and run the school and i just realized it's not for me you know that's yeah. just kind of not what i am i'm more of a professional development provider i'm more of the person who wants to look at curriculum look at instruction look at assessment mm -hmm. look and, and and not you know do a lot of the the more of the administrative leadership of the site, but more so coming up with programs, coming up with plans and stuff. So, so I guess that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a, a fresh take on having uh, that trench moment, right? And going through a difficult situation and then finding out where, you know, your um, expertise is best served. And um, I think like you're, you're kind of saying it, you're more of a macro level thinker, right? When looking at the whole system, working with the state department, than that micro at the building. Well, even micro at the building, I think the hard part of it, um, you know, I think the part, part of it, a lot of it was youth. A lot of it was mm -hmm. um, insecurity on my part. Um, mm -hmm. Probably even arrogance, you know, no, I'm the assistant principal, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and I, I think, you know, you, you really got to be ready. You got to ask yourself if you're, if you're ready and you got to ask yourself, why do you want to do this? I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave the classroom. I felt like I needed to, um, to have, you know, more so, I mean, I just had my, my, set, my second child with my mm -hmm. wife and, you know, we were two teacher salaries and I need to move up the salary schedule. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't going to happen, you know, by being in the classroom, unfortunately. And so, so, you know, that was kind of the reasons for it. Um, at the time, it was horrible. It was really a terrible experience. Um, but looking back in retrospect, it was um, something that set me on this path. It got me to talk to you today, you know, because mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now if um, I did not have that lack of success. And I think probably one of the best lessons it is, is that you always can bounce, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, when, when you hit the ground, you hit the bottom, people say you splat. No, I say you bounce and you just mm -hmm. got to decide how you bounce back with it. So I, I turned that um, lack of success into something that's even more successful than I ever thought it would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's dive into um, your uh, new book first. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, what um, it's built off of? You talked in the pre-chat about it's um, about an RTI model. Uh, it's coming out in October. Um, so what can people learn um, when the book is available and how will it help them? Well, the book's coming out in October. Pre-sales are gonna be the end of June. Uh -huh. um, so actually um, when we're recording this, it'll be next week. So pre-sales will be okay. So by the time this airs, probably it'll be all up and everything. Uh -huh. It's called, uh, Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge, a Method and Model for Deeper Teaching and Learning. Uh, about 10 years ago, we were introduced to a concept and a framework called Depth of Knowledge and Webb's DOK levels as part of the uh, implementation and rollout of the Common Core State Standards. The unfortunate thing is, is that we were given an inaccurate document, and that mm -hmm. document is the DOK wheel. Um, mm -hmm. If you've ever seen the DOK wheel, um, it's four spokes and it's full of verbs. Mm -hmm. Well, Depth of knowledge is not about the verb. It's about what comes after the verb. So, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, Norman Webb also did not create the wheel. It was created by somebody who uh, was an elementary teacher I heard out in Florida who just uploaded to the internet and said, this is depth of knowledge. Oh, wow. and yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. So, <laughs> so depth of knowledge actually started out as an alignment criteria. So Norman okay. Webb created depth of knowledge. He created this as one of 12 criterion for alignment studies. So you should look at your learning intention of your standards and say, what is the level of depth of knowledge demanded? Level one, two, three, or four, based upon what exactly and how deeply students must demonstrate their learning. Then you look at your assessment items and you say, what's that DOK level and how closely aligned are they? If it addresses the standard fully or more than three items on the assessment address the standard fully, 
then the assessment and the items fully aligned. If it mm -hmm. does 50%, it's acceptably. If the student can demonstrate their learning, but not the level demanded by the standard, it's insufficiently. So Florida was actually one of the first states to do their alignment studies with depth of knowledge. Traditionally, people use Bloom's taxonomy. Well, again, like I said, someone just uploaded that image to the internet and Karen has in her uh, first book, a uh, toolkit for uh, um, instruction assessment. I think that's the name of it. She pointed out how it's possibly based on this thing. Okay. This is the Bloom's Hot Wheel that was developed by Barbara Clark in her okay. book, Growing Up Gifted, she's a gifted specialist. So the only real difference between the DOK wheel and this is that this wheel has five spokes full of verbs and mm -hmm. the DOK wheel has four. So what Karen Hess did with it, um, she basically created this matrix where she superimposed Bloom's taxonomy with Webb's DOK level. So you should be able to use this matrix to say, okay, what is the verb that the students have to demonstrate or use? Mm -hmm. I think. So that's in the rows. And then you say, what is the depth of knowledge demanded? And you look in the columns and that will determine the cognitive rigor. What I did with it was that I turned it into what schools have been trying to do with depth of knowledge and what I got feedback about how to use it and just being creative with it. I turned it into a method and model of deeper teaching and learning. So it functions like an RTI multi-school okay. system support. So the way it works is, and this is gonna, I think really work because as we come back from this, uh, pandemic and our kids go return to on site learning didn't stop okay mm -hmm. if we determine the depth of knowledge demanded by the standard and we say this is the dok level mm -hmm. and we treat that learning intention of the standard like a finish line to say this is the finish line you have to cross to be proficient in fifth grade in fractions okay mm -hmm. and we start there and then we determine where the students are on their pathway of proficiency. So what level of depth of knowledge can they demonstrate their learning? That's where the teaching and learning begins. So let's say, I'll, I'll use multiplication. Let's say uh, the standard is fluently multiply multi-digit numbers using the standard algorithm. That's the mm -hmm. end. So mm -hmm. then I'll determine a DOK level. It's probably about a DOK one, maybe DOK two, because they have to apply knowledge constant skills to establish a play of examples. Those are the DOK scriptures I use. So what I'm saying is this is the finish line. Think of like an obstacle course. You know where the finish line is. Okay. Now, where are you on that course? Like, where are you in that pathway to proficiency? Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the standard algorithm for a multiplication is? No. Do you know what a multi-digit number is? Yes. Okay, good. Let's start there. Do you know how to mm -hmm. multiply? Yes. Okay, good. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. So now what I'm doing is instead of saying, what don't you know? I'm searching for what you do know. Okay. Teaching and testing for depth of knowledge starts and stops with the standards, but teaching and learning for depth of knowledge begins at the level where the students are mm -hmm. and then builds upon their strengths successes so they can rise to reach and go beyond what I call the DOK bar. That's the top. Okay. So what you're doing is you're using depth of knowledge as a strength builder. So you it's, and it's okay to go down to the foundational DOK levels. It doesn't mean less, it doesn't, it's more so reduced. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I talk about with it is that how we can use this and describe four different deeper ways students can demonstrate their learning. Okay, let's talk a little bit about those uh, ways um, that you're gonna include in your training. Um, you talked to me a little bit in the pre-chat about the strengths and skills that they have. Um, in, that we've just survived a global crisis. So we wanna build upon those skills, um, you know, that students have learned of resiliency and creativity. Right. So what you wanna do is, is that next year, go into next year thinking, realizing that there's four things we know, okay? Mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. four things we know for certain. Number one, there's been this thing called learning loss. Yeah. But learning loss is not inherent with the pandemic. It's not, mm -hmm basically something that's a result of the pain. Learning loss is basically something that happens all the time in education. You yeah. Kids get learning loss from summer vacation. Um, research shows there's learning loss from bad scheduling, bad teaching, okay? So know yeah. that that's one thing we know. The other thing we know is that there are gaps probably in learning because mm -hmm. a lot of times it's hard to fit in everything you have to in 180 days or so, okay? Mm -hmm. So there are gonna be some gaps and also because some schools have decided to take summer breaks. Some kids did not do summer school. 
um, they're going to have, again, that gap in learning loss. But here's the two positives that we need to really think about. Number one, students are coming back to us with a diverse, unique new set of strengths and skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pedagogy can't be our obstacle anymore. We can't say, oh, they're too young to do that because guess what? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have kindergartners who are now more computer savvy than ever. First grade, second grade, third grade. We have kids who basically learned also not only how to demonstrate their learning at rigorous levels, but also to be resilient. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they survived this thing. And that's the other thing I want, you know, people to realize is that these kids and us as educators, we survived and for some point even thrived during a global pandemic. So how can we tap into that? And that's kind of like where my focus is a lot with what I'm trying to tell uh, teachers. You, know, you mentioned that my PD is what I call academically rigorous, social, mm -hmm. emotionally supportive and student responsive. What I'm trying to also focus on is that there's a new three R's in education. And what if that three R is number one, rigor. Mm -hmm. And we define rigor based upon students uh, demonstrating different levels of thinking based upon whatever learning text on the use, Blooms, Marzano, Solo, mm -hmm. and understanding use their depth of knowledge in different contexts. So mm -hmm. with Web's DOK levels, there's four different deeper ways you can demonstrate your learning. You can either recall information or recall how to, to answer correctly. You can either apply knowledge, constant skills, or use information and basic reasoning to establish and explain with examples. Mm -hmm. DOK3 would be you think strategically or use complex reasoning supported by evidence to examine and explain. And the mm -hmm. simplest way to do that is give the kids an answer and ask them to justify why it's correct or incorrect, or ask them what if, which is gonna be a part of their lexicon because it's a big Disney show about Marvel um, movies that's coming out about what if and show mm -hmm. their stories. And a DOK4 is you either use extended reasoning supported by expertise or think extensively how you could explore and explain with examples and evidence over an extended period. So that's the rigor. So mm -hmm. the rigor is DOK1, answer it. DOK2, use and explain it. DOK3, use it and prove it. And DOK4, go for it. Okay. okay. So you're going to do things like that. The relationships, the relationships is that, and we talk about a student focus is how can we have students establish, examine, explore connections with the content, with the with their classmates, and with the community. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at relationships, like you're building relationships, you really get an investment, not only in terms of your relationship inter with interpersonally with others, but mm -hmm. also form a relationship with the content, you know, take okay. ownership of it and also form a relationship with your community. We got to reconnect these kids. They've been sitting here learning and interacting like this. And the other one is resilience. And resilience has now become a lot of the focus to talk about how kids can basically survive and thrive mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. hardship. It's replaced grit in a little bit, if you know about the concept of grit. Mm -hmm. um, and what I say about resilience is that resilience is how can we take our students' education, what they've learned, their experiences, what they've gone through, and their endowments, their personal skills, their, inner, their, their innate talents, mm -hmm. and develop that into strength, skills, and a sense of self. Okay. okay? I know this is what makes me strong because I have these skills and that's me, okay? So again, I think that's going to be probably the new three R's. And that's a lot of what I'm going to try to focus on as well as how to use depth of knowledge accurately. So that's mm -hmm. going to be kind of my, my uh, focus and mantra going into the new year. Yeah, and I think your book's coming out at a essential time just as we're kind of entering this post-pandemic era. And, you know, people are uh, reevaluating how they teach, how students learn and, uh, you know, building upon the school, the skills that kids already have, right? But looking at those three R's as well, right? That we're, we want to not go back to everything that we've done in the past, right? We want to become better and, um, you know, bringing in somebody like you to, to, to explain this and, and do PD, um, I think is having, uh, you know, will have a, a huge effect on some of those schools as well. Thank you. And, and I think a lot of it, we also need to, we need to be patient with ourselves as educators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, a lot of times what I'm doing right now with a lot of schools is that um, they're asking me to do professional development, which is great. And a lot of schools are also hesitant of it because, you know, we, we, we haven't really been in a classroom, many of us, for almost mm -hmm. a year, year and a half. Like my daughter was saying to me the other week, she goes, you realize, you know, I really haven't had a, a normal school year since eighth grade and now she's in 10th. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we need to do is really that first quarter we need to basically focus on reestablishing the relationships. Mm -hmm. And that means making the connections. That means rediscovering who we are. Before we set sail on that sea of rigor, we really need to basically get our sea legs back and we need to feel mm -hmm. comfortable. And it's getting to know each other. It's, it's, it's helping ease each other in there and reconnecting. And that's the thing about relationships. I think first quarter, we really should focus on the relationship. The rigor will come. Okay, mm -hmm. because rigor is not hard. Rigor is challenging. Rigor is about thinking deeply. You can do that with building relationships. It's about expressing and sharing the depth and extent of your understanding. But really, first quarter, focus on rebuilding those relationships, establishing not only just the routines, but also getting the kids to feel reconnected and, and acclimated, going into a classroom, feeling safe in the classroom, realizing hopefully that there's not going to be social distancing, realizing that you know, we can smile at each other because we're not mm -hmm. wearing our masks and communicate like that. That's what I would recommend a lot of schools do. Really focus on the relationships at first and then let the rigor come. And that's be better for not just the kids, but also the teachers as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that part about reestablishing kind of those procedures since we had to kind of veer off and do the uh, pandemic procedures, but now we're, um, you know, we're reestablishing what that means to, you know, um, live in this post pandemic era. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the 100 stop series. Um, so both of us are connected with Rick Jetter. He's been on the podcast and the um, 100 things that uh, all teachers should stop doing came out in May. So what chapter did you write and uh, what kind of message did you want to convey through your chapter? I wrote chapter 100. <laughs> um, my chapter is really funny. Um, a funny story about this. My chapter is stop teaching if you don't love the profession. Mm -hmm. And Rick, Rick and I are, are we've been uh, friends for years. I mean, Rick and I talk probably about once or twice a week um, mm -hmm. during a week, We're always texting or on the phone. They call, we call each other like every Sunday. Um, Rick said to me, man, I really want you to write that stop teaching if you don't love the profession. I said, Rick, I can write that in one, one, set, one word, <laughs> one page, quick, you know? Yeah. So what I really want to do, and I really want to tap into kind of like what my experience was as that assistant principal, I thought mm -hmm. my career was done. You know, I thought that now that I had this lack of success as an assistant principal, um, I thought that basically now I'm going to have to talk about, well, why, you know, did I only last a year there? Um, what, where can I go? Because, you know, they always talk about with, with um, um, in districts or in local education agencies, you have to teach, they prefer leaders who are out of sight before you can go to district office. Mm -hmm. um, so what I really did was, is I shaped it to say that if you don't love the profession anymore, Maybe it's not so much you don't love the profession, but you don't love what you're doing in the profession. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, as a teacher, if you're not enjoying being in the classroom, why don't you go look into being an instructional coach? Mm -hmm. um, if your passion is more about advocacy, which has really become huge, which educators right now, maybe you can become an education advocate. Maybe, you know, you can get more involved in your state or local association or, or union. In Arizona, we don't have unions associations out here um if you want more of a leadership position you can go for leadership uh, and but really think about what kind of leader you want to be it takes a special type of person to be a site administrator mm -hmm. it takes a special type of person to be in all those roles i mean i when i was an assistant principal i was in charge of discipline so i was getting like everything i mean the joke i used to say is my grandfathers were nypd officers they were glad I became a police officer. They always wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. They used to use their interrogation techniques. Fourth <laughs> hour. If the tips of your ears turn red, they're lying. If they roll their eyes to the left, they're lying. And if they go no, then they're definitely lying. Okay. <laughs> or yeah. you know, and 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 
you know, it really takes a special kind of person to do that. And you also have to really look at who you know, who's working with you to say, you may assign somebody to do discipline as more of like an academic person, more of an instructional leader person. So that was kind of my chapter to say, don't look at it as this is the end of your career, figure out other places you can go. And the other thing is, is that uh, two things that one, it's okay to leave the profession, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you have a set of skills as a teacher that a lot of companies will want. You can do public speaking, you can manage people. I mean, if you can herd first graders like cats, you can herd adults, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and basically, or there's now become this cottage industry of kind of like what I do, what Rick does, what a lot of us people who provide professional development and also um, write books, um, that you can get out there and, and start this whole career path. I mean, my, my thing with professional development started um, when I was a state, at the state education agency, I did training. I trained teachers on uh, English language development, structured English immersion, and then how to develop Title I programs. Uh, and then I just started designing my own professional development, structural strategies based upon what I use as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I just started applying for conferences. You know, and, and if you are a teacher at a site, it's better for you than it is for me because number one, financially, you can ask your principal, hey, I want to go to this conference and I'll present and I'll show the great things that we're doing there. And two, a lot of the conferences want actual classroom practitioners. They don't want guys like me who mm -hmm. think going to sell a product or something. So there is this outlet, there is this branch and you can choose to write a book, you can choose to write a blog, you can do a podcast like you know, you're doing right now. I think that's also the great thing that Rick is doing with the 100 Stop series is that, yeah, there's some authors in there, but he's allowed people who've never written a book to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you look at like the Twitter feeds on it and you look at everybody who's like attached to that book, everyone's so proud. Like, you know, yeah, I'm a part of that book. I'm a part of that book. I'm a part of this. And there's more to what you're doing and there's more to you. Figure out what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. And that's really mm -hmm. that whole Simon Sinek, find your why, start with why. Um, I did actually a PD on it, where it's like superhero origins, mm -hmm. where I combined uh, superhero origins with um, um, find your why and start your why. And it's like, you ask, why did you decide to wear the cape and cow? Okay, so your why is you come up with a mantra, two blank, so that blank. So my why is like to challenge thinking so that people will think deeply and make connections about things I've never thought about before. How do I do it? I ask questions. I push for depth of knowledge. I'm always pushing to basically, you know, boundaries, which is what Rick's um, company is, pushing boundaries. What do I do? I provide professional development as an average education. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Go back, find out what was your origin? Why did you become a teacher? It's like, Batman became Batman because his parents were killed. Superman became Superman because he was sent from another world and his father instilled in him the values of a Roman farmer. You know, Spider-Man became Spider-Man because he went great power comes great responsibility. Why? How do they do it? Batman uses utility belts and martial arts. Superman, you know, flies around strange. Spider-Man uses web shooters across walls. Who are they? I'm Batman. I'm Spider-Man. I'm Superman. Say that. You need to get back if that's the thing. If you're lost with it, what makes you say, I'm Mr. Francis or whatever you are as a teacher? And, I, and that's kind of what my chapter in a roundabout way was, was that to say, stop teaching if you don't love the profession, but really try to figure out where your path can take you. You don't have to leave education if you just don't like what you're doing.